Okay. Thank you. Three, two. Good afternoon. I now call to order the meeting of the Curriculum Committee for June 16, 2022. In accordance with Board Policy 8311, the chair of a committee, at her discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison, may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Cox, would you please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee? Yes, Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Present. Ms. Causey? Mr. Thomas? Here. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cox. And Ms. Cox, would you please call the role of staff members participating in today's meeting? Dr. McComas? Present. Dr. Holmes? Dr. Wistead? Present. Ms. Shea? Present. Ms. Ferguson? Present. Dr. Ellendorf? Please think. Dr. Ellendorf? Sorry, here. <laughs> and Mr. Conley. Present. Thank you. And we also have um, Ms. Stansbury. Present. Ms. Machinda. Present. Ms. Rio de la Rosa. Present. Ms. Mustafer. Present. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Cox. Um, I am going to turn the meeting over to Dr. McComas to get us started. Yes, ma'am, thank you. Um, so our first item on today's agenda is um, approval of next year's curriculum committee dates. These dates, hi Ms. Causey, these dates were um, uh, identified. We worked in collaboration with Ms. Gover around the dates. Uh, you'll notice uh, the only distinction here is there, there will not be a routine meeting in December and January, just in light of allowing the new board time to get their feet on the ground um, and uh, get oriented. Um, but other than that, it's a routine schedule where it's typically the third Thursday of each month, I believe. A little difference where spring break falls, of course. Okay, does anybody have any questions about the curriculum contract? Uh, this is Mr. Offerman. Uh, I will not be able to attend on. Uh, I will not be able to attend uh, on the 22nd of. Uh, excuse me, the 22nd of. Uh, tw excuse me. I will not be able to attend on on September 22nd. I'm just letting you know. Okay, okay Mr. You. Offerman, and I think it would be appropriate at this point to let you know that I did follow up on the question that I think you asked in the last meeting about. Um, needing to have more board, board members and I believe it is Ms. Hen's intention um, to ask our new board member if she would like to join the team through the duration of this year um, since she is a um, former BCPS teacher I believe. So thank you. Um, that will help us a little bit. Great thank you. Okay. Um, so I believe we need a motion to approve. Ms. Max. I think, oh, yeah, I'm, I think sorry. I'm, I, I'm sorry, I'm still signing in. I'm still having PC problems. No. So just please tell me if you have a question or a comment. Yeah. I believe Ms. Causey was first. Okay, go ahead, Ms. Causey. Uh, thank you, Ms. Mack. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would just uh, make a suggestion that in January, there be a curriculum committee meeting uh, but without, um, you know, action items, uh, okay. so that so that staff could, uh, you know, go through the typical process, you know, how things have gone in the past, more as an orientation, um, because there, sure. I know there's so much work that gets done in your department, um, Dr. McComas, that, you know, I would hate for too much time to go by without having a curriculum committee. Uh, ready to to process the work so that that okay. would be suggestion on my part 
OK, thank you. And I appreciate you, you know, recognizing how much we do together. So um, so if we add, with adding that and we can do that, we can add it would be January 19th would be the third Thursday of that month. So um, that's the Thursday following the, I think Martin Luther King holiday is the, that Monday. So we'll add January 19th and we'll take your advice as a sort of helping an orientation opportunity to help the new board committee get their groundings on what, you know, all that we do. So we will add that date. Thank you. You're welcome. And Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Ms. Mack. I was actually going to suggest something similar uh, to what Ms. Causey said about like an orientation for new board members. One other thing um, is also something like that for the student member of the board, if she serves on this committee, which I'm assuming she will hopefully. Um, Aroa, just to kind of orient like what's the how does it go? What does a year typically look like? You know, I know at the end of the year there's a lot of contracts coming forward. So like preparing them that the student member for that. Um, so just kind of like an orientation to this committee. Um, I think it's perfect. And I also wanted to. Well, I had something else. No, I didn't actually. Thank you. I said it already. OK, thank you everyone for your insight um, on how we can support um, that transition time. So we will add January 19th to the schedule. And uh, with that, if we could have it approved with January 19th on there. <laughs> so Fox. Oh, OK, do I have a motion to approve the Curriculum Committee 2022-2023 dates with the inclusion of a January date? So move, Thomas. Do, do I have a Pause. OK, um, Ms. Cox, may I have a roll call vote, please? Sure. Ms. Mag? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Thank the you. motion passes. Thank you. Um, moving right along, um, Dr. McComas. Sure, thank you. And thank you everyone for um, the discussion locking those in. So our next item, uh, all our items for this meeting are for approval. So our next one um, is a contract that you will see coming up in the July um, board meeting and contracts committee meeting. This is middle school mathematics tutoring program for students who may be experiencing homelessness. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Wistet and Ms. Stansberry. And I, um, I want to make sure I say your name correctly. Ms. De La Rosa. <laughs> I'm used to calling you by your first name, Lawrence. So thank you. Uh, go ahead. I'll, I'll hand it over. Um, and also, I, I, I believe that um, Ms. Mashinda is with us as well from the Office of Mathematics. Oh. So this is a collaboration between the two um, departments within curriculum instruction. So we, uh, as you may know, our Office of Title I and, and Grant Programs also serves um, to support our students experiencing homelessness. And we um, have grant funds, which we are using for a tutoring program specifically for middle school students. And Ms. Stansberry and uh, team are here to explain to you uh, what that's about. Thank you, Melissa. Um, if we could advance to the next slide. Thank you. So um, we really tried to take a look at specifically our students who are experiencing homelessness across all grade levels and how were they performing in relation to our BCPS campus and our homeless program multi-year plan. And what you'll notice here is that the campus and the multi-year plan are very much aligned. We had a goal in school year 2021 to be able to address um, programs specifically to meet the academic needs of students who are experiencing homelessness. And as you know, that was slightly delayed, as many things were. Um, and so now we're in a space where we're able to begin to work really more deeply in this area. Um, and we also received additional grant funds through the American Rescue Plan. Um, we have two grant allocations for that, which really have given us an opportunity to invest significantly in this type of program and determine whether or not future investments using Title I and McKinney-Vento funds will be funneled in the same direction. If we can advance to the next slide. Um, this is a pretty much a picture of what homelessness looks like in Baltimore County as of June 2nd. I'm actually going to give Ms. Lori Dijo a lot of De La Rosa, I'm, uh, Rijo De La Rosa, I'm sorry, I say her name all the time, an opportunity just to explain a little bit about what you see here. Lori? 
Sure, so what we're looking at right now is the total enrollment of students who are approved through the McKinney Vento statute and um, what you're looking at at the other map is where our children are enrolled. What is really important to understand is where our children are enrolled is not necessarily where they reside, which does create barriers for our children to attend some of the traditional after school enrollment and um, mentoring and, and, and different kinds of things that are offered. Thank you, Lori. Mm -hmm. You can advance to the next slide. This representation shows a little bit about where um, those students are not just enrolled, but then also the schools that they're enrolled in. And what you'll notice is the majority of our students who are experiencing homelessness are either in elementary or high school. And we do have some programs in place to support both of those. But we really felt like although the middle school population isn't as large, this, they still have significant needs. And we wanted to make sure that we were addressing those needs in a very direct way. If we advance to the next slide, um, what you will see is why did we choose math? So as everyone knows, middle school math is a system-wide priority. Mathematics is a system-wide priority. Um, Algebra one is a graduation requirement and we have a new middle school mathematics curriculum that will um, continue to impact all of our students in middle schools. As well as the fact that our student achievement data for students experiencing homelessness is disproportional to those who are not. And so when we think about how this group is performing and we consider all of the factors that contribute to their success, we really felt like math was a place where we should invest our energies. This will not replace existing tier one, tier two, and tier three invention, interventions. This will be in addition to those interventions. And as Lori shared a moment ago, there are limitations around access to after school um, programs and academic supports when students are enrolled in schools that aren't necessarily in a location that is near where they currently reside or temporarily reside. Next slide. So we invest, we are committed um, to making sure we hear the voices of our stakeholders. And what you see listed here is a depiction of who those stake, stakeholders are. We are 100% partners with our friends in the Office of Mathematics and have included them in this process. We also, Lori works very closely with our families and speaks to them often. We have um, external advisory committees that Lori participates on as well, as well as other staff who are really looking at overall, what are the supports that are necessary for our families experiencing homelessness across the county in addition to our students. We hear regularly with um, information from the pupil personnel workers, and then we have our program advisory committee, our PAC committee, and that PAC committee includes school-based staff, which are teachers, paras, administrators, central office staff across the entire central office system, as well as community partners, students, and families. So we really took some time to make sure, not just that we were um, looking at data to make decisions, but also we enforced that data with some qualitative um, information from all of our stakeholder groups. Next slide. So what were we looking for in a program? We were looking for a program that was aligned to grade level standards and expectations. We wanted to make sure that the program scaffolds skills and accelerates learning for students by using acceleration strategies. We were looking for a lot of flexibility, um, programs that potentially could do small group or even one-on-one -on -one tutoring. We wanted to make sure that um, vendors had experience working with similar populations in urban communities. And we also wanted to make sure that we had options for our students to potentially receive those supports in person or virtually. We already provide our students experiencing homelessness with access to hotspots, mobile hotspots, so that they could participate virtually if they needed to. And then finally, we really needed, which, which was exceptionally important, to have some flexibility around hours and locations in which services would be provided. 
Next slide. So when you look at the anticipated cost, we are anticipating that this cost would be approximately 200,000 per year. Now, this is a very rough estimate because as you know, students experiencing homelessness aren't always homeless from year to year, but when and if they are, or if they continue to have um, temporary housing, we wanna make sure that we had enough funding available to service anyone who needed the support. We are not anticipating that every middle school student experiencing homelessness will need support in mathematics. The, the supports may look different for, um, for sp specific students, but we did wanna make sure that we were at least considering a 50% participation rate from our students who are in middle school grades. Again, small group one-on-one -on -one options are important as well as in person and virtual. The um, base, the estimate that you see is based on a about $1,200 per year per student. I mean, per 12 weeks per student, um, because we wanna make sure that there's, we don't just capture students in the beginning of the year. We're really looking at 12 week cycles and um, homelessness can happen at any point in the year. So we had to really make sure that we were thinking through how are we starting services and then reevaluating the needs and then adding in students who may not have been added in at a certain point in the year. Can it thanks? Program effectiveness, probably one of the most important slides, because as I shared with you earlier, we're using our American Rescue Plan funds to begin the implementation of this program. But our goal is to think through how we may more effectively use our McKinney-Vento and Title I reservations for homelessness. So program effectiveness will be exceptionally important to us. How will students be selected to participate? So we're looking at an uh, intersection of multiple data points, not just one. So students who may have attendance needs as well as um, are demonstrating some deficits in MCAP, MAP, or even on report cards. It may also include a combination of office referrals and suspensions, and then potentially some recommendations from their caregivers or staff members at their school. Um, also, then we'll be looking more at um, programming uh, monitoring through um, the following metrics that you see listed, which are pretty much similar to those metrics that we're using to identify um, which students would participate. Next slide, which I think is our last slide. That concludes the discussion, and and um, I want to thank um, Michinda, Miss Michinda. Dr. Mishinda, I think it is, um, Dr. Mishinda, for joining us in this, in this journey because we have learned so much about how our partnership can be um, very supportive to not just this population, but all of our, our students in our Title I schools. So I will open it up for questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Stansberry. Yes. Or is it Dr. Stansberry? <laughs> okay. Um, yes. Board members, do you have questions? None from Offerman. Oh, I'm sorry, I guess Mr. Um, Thomas. Thank you. Um, my question is really about what's the biggest difference between uh, this mathematics middle school tutoring program to the ones we have, what we have for elementary school and high school. Uh, is it just kind of the supports in the in the content in mathematics or are the high school and elementary school ones based on something else besides math? Very good question, um, and I can, um, I can, we can only speak about um, the programs we've identified for our students experiencing homelessness, and, and I'll let Dr. Michonne to speak to our other programs. Um, we were providing tutoring support for students who resided in a shelter, and what we found in looking deeply into the data, and Lori can, can definitely elaborate on this a little bit more, um, a lot of our students experiencing homelessness are not residing in shelters. And so although that's where we were offering tutoring services across all grade levels, it really wasn't something that was as impactful as we felt it could be. Um, but, um, Ms. Rio De La Rosa, do you want to add on to that a little bit? 
I do. Um, I want to first bring a comment about the vulnerability of our students and the importance of providing connections that are very individual and an opportunity to engage a family member in that process as well through a virtual format or a flexible setting. So um, in all fairness, I, I'm I do not believe that would be offered through a regular school program, but an opportunity for a child who has experienced a lot of instability to receive some very focused support while their parent can be there and their parent can begin to feel more connected with the education of their child, we feel is very, very important. Also, the flexibility of timing. Um, we have children um, that, that may be in a shelter or may be in another kind of living situation where they really do not have the opportunity to stay after school for a program. Um, they need to get home or they need to get to another location. So again, that flexibility of possibly being able to provide some support after dinner, um, we believe would be very, very crucial for our children. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think that's amazing. But do we have like a, a mathematics tutoring program for similar to this for Spring Friends Day for high school and elementary school? We do not. Um, in our high okay. schools, we have a mentoring program that prepares students for college readiness. Okay. In our elementary program prior to the pandemic, our BCPS teachers were implementing an academic and social emotional after school program um, at a variety of schools as a pilot. We are revisiting how we might be able to stand that back up now that we are back in school in a, on a more regular schedule. So we had some options that were pretty consistent that we are going back to. Um, but we've never had an option that just spoke um, focused specifically on our middle school population, at least for um, our middle school population experiencing homelessness. OK, well, I support this, but I was just curious as to yeah. if we have similar things in middle school, high school, awesome. elementary school. Yeah, Yeah. thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Ms. Causey, did you have any questions? Yes, thank you. Um, I appreciate this presentation. I appreciate the um, efforts of really um, helping this um, group of students that definitely need this support. I was curious um, about the locations um, because I heard the key about the difficulty in transportation and we know that um, there's a lot of students for whatever reason um, that <clears throat> are unable to access after school activities, whether they're uh, dependent on transportation or they may have obligations with their family or um, or other issues. So is there an opportunity for in person? During the school day? So we were actually not um, looking at pulling students during the school day um, for a variety of reasons. We didn't want to take them away from the core, um, but we have some other programming that's in place in order to ensure that we can make that students have at least when I think about transportation needs have the um, access to the transportation needs that that require them to get to where they need to be at whatever given time and we are devoting money in other ways to eliminate barriers that would prevent them from having after school supports one is hot spots the other is um, we pay for immediate cab service to and from school when a bus route cannot be um, identified as quickly as we would like for it to be. And so we, we have other pieces in place to eliminate those barriers so that students do have the flexibility and families have the flexibility to choose. Would I like my child to stay at school and receive this support simply because the conditions at school may be more um, conducive for that, or would I prefer that my child work virtually at a location with me? So we wanted to give options and not just um, one avenue. OK, so, when it, so for the opportunity for in-person one on one, um, I know that there's a lot of um, tutoring programs that meet students at libraries, for instance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it would be up to the family to uh, determine what what would be best suited for their student and their situation. Correct, and we cover the cost of getting the child to that location from school if necessary. So if the location that the family chooses 
is different than um, where the student would go at the end of a regular school day, we would cover the transportation costs associated with getting the student to that location. OK, wonderful. I, I really support this. Um, for several years, I was on the um, P20 Leadership Council, which is a statewide group at anal <laughs> analyzing uh, different issues with education and uh, developing a um, potent job uh, workforce. And uh -huh. one of the things they were talking about with GEDs, with students that don't end up graduating, is the difficulty uh, with overcoming that math deficit, whereas there's literacy programs and so forth. Um, so it's so important that the children uh, can have the opportunity to become proficient, you know, in middle school. And so then when they reach high school, they don't get frustrated, you know, or overwhelmed or so yeah. that's wonderful. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Causey. Um, actually, Ms. Causey, you asked part of one of my questions about the physical location. And I fully support this, but I, how, is there a scheduling mechanism? How does how does the student schedule time where the student wants to be and who will be providing the tutoring at the location that is convenient for the student? I, that's that's what I'm getting. Yeah, um, so I'll let um, Lori speak a little bit to our relationship between our families experiencing homelessness and PPWs and there is a very close relationship. Um, but once we select a vendor and we we have we are going through the vendor selection process, that vendor would be the one that's delivering the actual services. Now, if we have BCPS staff that are that would like to work with that vendor, we would welcome that. But we didn't want to add on more responsibility to the plates of staff who are already doing things at the school. And if a school has a program in place that a student feels um, is more appropriate, we would 100% pay the cost of making sure that that student had at least transportation home from school if they decided to stay for an after school program. Lori, do you want to talk a little bit about how we will make the determination with families? Sure. I mean, right now the model that we have is that our people personnel workers are the um, direct case managers for our families that are experiencing homelessness. And typically what we've done with our other programs is our people personnel workers have coordinated that family information with us and then we organize things centrally. Um, you know, one example is um, we provide extensive taxi service, mm -hmm. as Ms. Stansberry mentioned, getting to and from school to participate in clubs or school events or or different kinds of meetings. And we had developed a process that our um, office is alerted and we keep track of all of those. And then we work with the vendor to coordinate the actual details. And then it is communicated back with the family. So those processes that we have used for our taxi service, for our New Horizons program, for our St. Vincent program, we would replicate those same models. Um, thank you very much. Um, I do have another question. There is a contract, JNI 76714, and the description of that contract says, con um, this was a modification, will provide for the continuous use of web-based mathematics programs for students in grades 6 through 12. The program expands the opportunity for online learning and provides individualized tutoring. How does this contract complement that and how is it different? Um, Dr. Mishenda, do you want to speak to that? Yeah, if, if Megan, I'm not sure which vendor yeah, this that is. That came in place before Ms. Mishinda was with us. So hi. So good afternoon. I may be able to shed some light. Um, Ms. Mishinda, it is referring, I believe, to the Ascend Math program. I just got to that page, yes. Yep. So um Ms. Mack, the Ascend program is a resource that was used in many of our comeback math classes as a supplemental resource to support that customized instruction that often was a part of some of those um, resource room or comeback math courses that were scheduled in the middle and high school. Um, Ms. Machinda and team have really been reimagining the use of that schedule 
um, so that it's better supportive of our new illustrative math curriculum rollout since in the last two years we have overhauled the math curriculum as you know um, from from K through 12. Um, I don't believe at this point that there are any schools currently using Ascend licenses. I would have to double check, um, but I believe that while the contract hasn't expired yet, I don't believe in practical application schools are using those licenses um, specifically because of the shifts we've made to the illustrative math curriculum and the design of those comeback supports. Um, I can certainly double check on that and follow up. Um, to be sure, although it is the last day of schools and most teachers have left, I can certainly work on getting any data. Um, typically, and the reason that I feel, and I, although I will invite Ms. Mishinda to um, answer, is that typically we centrally uh, support the um, licensing and, and we have not done that to date, um, which is why I feel that um, it's not currently in use. Thank you. I, I would appreciate a follow up sure. at some point. And then my last question, um, I know from experience that children who are experiencing homelessness cycle in and out of a geography. Like where I live, I might have a bed to sleep in the county tonight, but for the next four months, I could be two miles down the road, which is in the city. What happens to the coordination of a student's care when that happens, because that's a very real issue for students who are experiencing homelessness. Absolutely. Um, I know that Ms. Rio De La Rosa is going to um, knock this one out the park, so I'm going to turn it over to her. I think that's the reason that we specifically wanted a program like this that allows some flexibility and allows a virtual option and allows that connection in a virtual setting for a parent to participate in the educational process because sometimes with everything that is happening in their life they can um, feel disconnected to the school. I also want to connect it back to your other question about Ascend Math. Um, when we're using generalized programs that our, our school system offers, those online or face-to-face -face supports are not the same person that's working with the child every day. And we have seen some data through our previous shelter programs, and even right now with our new taxi service, that when a family has a person that they are coordinating with every day or every week, and it is the same person for their um, child, that they build a strong connection with them and the data improves. So that flexibility of that online option is why we felt that it was really, really paramount. Now, the other thing is if, if a child chooses to have that, surface at, that service at school, we have our contract with our taxi service that is showing a lot of flexibility and we can change the um, transportation at a day's notice and the transportation service that we're utilizing also has a model where it is one driver assigned to a family so the family and the driver can communicate and change those locations as needed. Well and um, Ms. Mack just to also explain that when a child like your example of they're in the county one day and then two weeks later they live in the city. The McKinney-Vento Act um, requires that if the family wants to remain in the Baltimore County Public School, they do so for the remainder of the year. So hopefully that addresses oh, no, that. that okay. Let me be clear. I presume that that would happen, yeah. but I, you know, I know when you're experiencing homelessness, you're not the first thing on your list is to say not to say, hey, let me tell Baltimore County where I'm going to be, <laughs> you know, for the next six months. And I just wanted. To make sure that for to the extent possible, there was a continuity of services. Yeah, but thank you for that explanation. Um, do I have a motion to approve this contract for hold on? Um, I have too many screens open here. If somebody could give me the contract name, that would be helpful. Um, out, out of school time program. Oh, sorry, I'm going on to the next one. I got ahead of myself. Sorry, Ms. Mack. Um, <laughs> middle school math tutor for students experiencing homelessness. Do I have a motion to approve that? So move, Thomas. Do I have a second? Second, Ms. Causey. May I have a roll call vote, please, Ms. Cox? Yes, Ms. Mack. Mack I, oh. I had put in the chat, I had a question before you. Okay. okay. Yes. Um, so, Related to the um, dovetailing with 
uh, earlier questions. Ascend math, we're paying license fees for, but not being used. No. If how, I may. How, what is that? No. If that That's could be clarified. Correct. We do not pay for any license unless it is being used. So what we have done in the past, and I'm going to confirm, I do not believe we're using any licenses, but what has happened in the past, we have a contract with spending authority that would allow us to purchase licenses as needed, but because that number changes based on schedules and who is uh, providing those comeback math opportunities, what has been the practice in years past is in the summer, if schools are offering that opportunity and if Ascend licenses would be a part of that opportunity, they would request a specific number of licenses and then we only pay for the licenses that are actually going to be used in any given year. Wonderful, thank you. I wanted to clarify that. And also yep. in reviewing this um, contract, there was a statement that uh, per student, it, it's approximately $1,200 for 12 weeks. And I was curious how many hours of tutoring would that estimate include per week? Uh, two hours per week. Okay. Okay, thank you. Ms. Okay, Cox, you. roll call vote, please. Sure. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Thank you. Mo motion passes. Um, moving right along, Dr. McComas. Yes, ma'am. Um, so our next one, it's our same um, leadership team will stay on. Uh, this is out of school time programs, focusing on art and world um, curriculum for academic enrichment. Thanks. And I'll, I just want to set the stage for this one and uh, remind the, the team that we were uh, at a Board of Education Curriculum Committee back in the fall, I think it was October, talking about community schools. And I know we've been, you know, talking about them in many different ways since then. Um, but you may recall that we talked about the amount of funding that each community school receives. And this is one of those programs we told you will be back for many contracts, you know, in order to spend the funds through the community schools um, and concentration of poverty grant. So this is just another example of using um, funds that community schools are interested in spending on, and it could be multiple schools uh, with that concentration of poverty grant. So I wanted to set the stage for that. Thank you, Melissa. Um, if we could advance to the next slide. So, the way that, interestingly enough, the federal CDC defines out of school time programs would be any program in which students are supervised and regularly attend when school is not in session. That could be the summer, it could be on the weekend, it could be before or after school hours. And what you'll notice is um, research out of the RAND Foundation from 2017 really shows that out of school time programs can have an impact on not just academics, but overall student success. Next slide. Again, as always, we are always connected to our VCPS campus through student and staff supports, and this is part of our community school roadmap. The roadmap is our evaluation metric for how we are determining whether or not the efforts and funding put towards community schools actually is making a difference and has an impact on our communities with concentrated levels of poverty. Next slide. We are in, based on the research from the RAND Foundation. What you'll see here is that the out of school time programs have the greatest impact on supporting positive student behaviors, but as well, there are impacts on attendance and access to coursework and how students do in with their report card grades, as well as state and local assessments. Next slide. As we do with everything, this is a real cross collaborative effort. The Office of Mathematics, of English Language Arts, Science, World Language, Fine Arts, and our school based shared decision making teams all had some level of input in how, what types of out of school time programs were necessary for our schools. Uh, this is actually two grant, two contracts. There will be a contract for programs just focused on arts and world culture 
activities. This gives students exposure to fine arts and world culture extra extracurricular activities. And then there will be a separate contract for academic enrichment programs and that we will come back in August to the board curriculum committee to give more details on. But the academic enrichment program is really how a student applying academic skills through project based and real world learning opportunities. Next slide. What you see listed here are some of the potential programs that we um, may be bringing forward. African dance, steel drums, theater, including improv and script, photography, graphic design, culturally diverse musical instruments, artistic design, world language clubs. All of our examples of art and world culture programs. Academic enrichment programs such as engineering, creative writing, cooking, coding, robotics, so on and so forth, as you see listed here, all take those academic skills that students are learning during the school day and give them the opportunity to apply those skills in project based and real, real world learning opportunities. So you'll see um, sewing. We can incorporate so many different concepts from the school day instructional program into um, projects such as sewing and graphic design and even mural painting. Next slide. We um, want to make sure that whatever vendor and community partner we work with, that there is no more than a, an 11 to 1 student teacher ratio. Many times in programs that are around the arts, um, require smaller groups so there is a better attention to supporting students and coaching them through the process. Again, we're looking at 12 week programs for up to 50 students and school based shared decision making teams must decide this is a priority before schools can commit funding to um, this type of program. And so we are doing some early projections based on current interest and based on um, availability of funds. As you know, through the blueprint for Maryland's future, um, the concentration of poverty grant phases in the per pupil allocation funding to schools across several years. And we are in year two or phase two of that rollout where we went from three schools having access to that funding and now we will have seven schools and in the following year that number will ex exceed 20. And so um, over time what you will notice is that there are more and more schools having access to more funding that would allow their shared decision making team to really think through the best um, out of school time programs for their students. The cost of those programs are usually more expensive at the middle and high school level than they are at the elementary level. So that's why you will see the approximate value be a little different for elementary versus middle and high. And again, the cost per youth for approximately 12 weeks is about $620 per student. And that actually is looking at, again, just two hours a week of giving those levels of support. There are some, some programs that may require a little more than that. And we try to um, account for that in, in some of the estimated costs in the contracts, total spending authority. Next slide. How are we funding? Again, concentration of poverty grant, Title I, local, state, federal grants. We may have some businesses and corporate sponsorship and donations, even fundraising. There are competitive grants that can help for sustainability over time. Even our schools that don't have access to blueprint funding may be able to look at um, some of the funding sources that you see listed here. And we do, in some instances, have community members who are looking to volunteer and offer their services free of charge to provide a steel drum class or um, other other opportunities for students to engage in something very productive outside of the school day. Next slide. Program effectiveness, you will always see this. Again, how are we determining what students could best access the resource? Well, we're looking at their attendance, we're looking at office referrals, academic risk factors, and even recommendations from families. Some students already access these programs and some students just simply don't have 
access to these types of programs in their community at all. And so it really will vary depending on um, the school community and the neighborhood and what already exists in that community. Effectiveness data will be tied to absenteeism rates. Are we seeing an increase or a decrease in absenteeism as a result of students participating in programs before and after the school day? Are we seeing a difference in office referrals and suspensions? Because naturally, out of school time programs, even though they aren't necessarily earmarked specifically for mentorship, mentorship is just something that naturally comes out of those relationships that students build in their out of school time programs. And that, that mentorship could have an impact on referrals and suspensions. Differences in core content and academic data or any combination of the data points I have already mentioned. And I think the next slide concludes for us. Thank you, Ms. Stansberry. I'm going to start with a few questions. Thank you very much for this information. Um, we often talk about resources within a school or the wherewithal to um, co do coordination that's required for these types of programs. Are we going to have the coordination take place at a central location or is it up to school based administrators to do the coordination to build the partnerships with the people who could provide this type of um, yeah. support? Yes, so every school has a community school facilitator whose sole job is to build community partnership relationships that benefit the school. That person will be the one that coordinates who attends, where services will be provided. And in some instances, it may not necessarily be at the school. It could be at a neighboring um, PAL center or community center or in a different location. Maybe we are the school could essentially put funding towards transportation to get students to and from the best location where services can be provided. So again, this really varies based on the school and the community around the school and what they have access to. Well, actually, that was my next question. Um, the price, to, not the price to transport, but you know, in some communities, there are so many like um, senior living facilities. Yeah. Um, would can, would we coordinate with senior living facilities to have people who want to, who have you know experience or knowledge to share to get those people who reside there into our schools? Would we be, do the background checks? I mean, could that is that all included in this? It absolutely is, and I think that over time. We are really in year four, and, and even though year four of rolling out a full system-wide community school model seems like we're well into it, we really aren't. There's still so much to learn about it, and I think over time, what you're going to notice is more and more of that is going to happen. Our community school facilitators have been in place since October of this year, and they've made a lot of headway. And that example that you've given may not necessarily be associated with contract costs, but it could be associated with transportation costs and schools can commit their funding to that. So it's really more about making sure we know where those resources are and we can find a way to coordinate getting those resources either to the school or getting our students to those resources. I can just imagine, you know, the wealth of knowledge and, and skill set, um, even in, in some of our senior living facilities, that they exactly. would love to be able to do some things with our kids. We just need to get out there and um, make connections with them and figure out what the barriers are and find the funding to eliminate those barriers. So I think my, you'll my still last question and, and thank you because that's um, but my last question is this. Are we going to have any stop points along the way at, and look at schools and say school A has set up 22 partnerships, maybe because of location or because of tenacity and c contacts? But yes. school B has only set up five and Correct. help that help that school. Yes, so we're we're revamping the model so that their schools are not working in isolation, but they're working in neighborhoods. So I'll use the Chesapeake feeder pattern as a as an example. We um, are using Maryland Leeds funds, hopefully as soon as we get them to create a neighborhood stabilization 
community school model. So what that really means is that the facilitators from the three elementary schools that particularly feed into um, the middle schools that feed into the high schools are all working together on their community partnerships instead of them working on them in isolation. So the facilitators we already have are actually in their third meeting discussing that. How are they sharing partners? Because students that live in the Chesapeake feeder pattern move around the pattern and need access to the same resources no matter where they go. So we are looking at a more coordinated effort that, that's what I'm people. asking about. Yes, yeah, for a holistic, a right? Okay, yeah, and not just a school. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. uh, any other board members have questions? Hearing none, may I yes, have a vote? Oh, sorry. yes, Ms. Beck. Um, I just wanted to thank you for this um, work and this presentation. Um, and I, I appreciate the discussion of the locations and and also utilizing community partners and reaching out uh, to people that have skills and would want to help contribute um, to our children. I have seen on slide. Uh, it doesn't have a number. I think it's two, three. Um, the community school roadmap, the evaluation metrics, mm -hmm. and it has. Um, in the purple one, parents feeling of partnership in their child's learning, parental awareness of student academics, and so I'm curious how the parent or, car or guardian or caregiver, um, in what way is their involvement? Um, you know, what, what is that possibility? Yeah, the survey. So um, in addition to our stakeholder survey, that is our first survey level of, of information from our families, but then we also have a specific community survey that talks about access to out of school time programs and parent perceptions around that. We also have listening sessions and key informant interviews. Those are one on one and small group conversations with families and our facilitate our community school facilitators facilitate that process. We collect that periodically. We collect it before we start programming and then we collect it periodically along the way on an annual basis. And then at the end of a three year period, we compile all of that information to look at effectiveness not just by school, but again, effectiveness by school, but then effectiveness across neighborhoods. OK, great. Thank you. I didn't know if there was parent volunteer opportunities. Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. Already happening when I think about food pantries, we already have families who are volunteering to lead that so that school staff can focus their energies on other activities. So um, we're built the, the goal of community schools is really to build leadership advocacy of the people that reside in the community and not so much the school taking on all the work and it's already happening. Well, that's great and we've seen that in a lot of schools, especially with yeah. the pandemic and even uh, before then, but stepping up during the pandemic and, and sustaining. Yeah. Um, and then with the out of school time, I know that you had the federal CDC definition and you mentioned weekends and summer. I didn't hear after school. Is that also a possibility? And I just missed that. Yes, absolutely. Before and after school are also possibilities as well. Before and after. OK, great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for answering those questions. May I have a motion to approve out of school time programs, art and world curriculum, academic enrichment contract? We'll move, Ms. Causey. Second. Second. Thomas. Do I have a second? Mr. Thomas. Ms. Cox, may I have a roll call vote? Sure. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The motion passes and it looks like the next um, contract is Loving Guidance Conscious Discipline. Um, I can turn it over directly to you, Dr. McComas, or Ms. Ferguson and Ms. Mustafer. You can turn it right over to Ms. Ferguson, Ms. Muff must refer just to save time. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm joined by Patricia Mustafer, um, and we will go through the proposal for conscious discipline. We are looking for approval to move forward. Um, so in, just in the interest of time, I'm going to have Tricia go through um, the slides. So next slide, please. All right, thank you for having us here um, today to speak about this contract. Um, let's talk a little bit about conscious discipline and, and our focus really with aligning to our compass. 
Um, this contract is being pursued to continue the journey of professional learning consultation, as well as the provision of materials towards implementation in pre-K to five um, in our classrooms, uh, all for the purpose of social emotional learning practice, which you will see on the left hand side of the slide. Um, that is the social emotional learning framework as established by Castle. The things that you will note in that framework is that we're looking always through a lens of social emotional learning to build competency in all areas. We are working towards, sorry, building competency um, for our students in their communities, with their families, with a high level of structure, uh, with use of conscious discipline for classrooms as well as schools. Um, so this practice, this practice is part of the SEL initiative to increase those competencies in alignment with the Castle 5 across environments. Next slide, please. So let's talk about the what, the why, the how, um, and let's just dive in a little bit. Understanding that conscious discipline focuses on the adult mindset um, and how we shift. Um, so that teachers are, are prepared to support their students using the um, CD three guiding principles. The first being we're able to control and change ourselves as opposed to controlling and changing others. The second is really laden in the brain science that our brains are specifically designed to exist in and respond to relationships. Connections, that's important. And we all know with COVID how important relationships are. We need to teach children in the third premise. We need to teach children to resolve conflict rather than avoid it and punish it away. So the practice supports all members of the team BCPS in their self-regulation as well as social emotional well-being through awareness of brain states. Um, and that comes through in the training where we're addressing social emotional learning. By doing this, we, we really cultivate and empower our students, our adults as well, to feel safe enough in their environments in order to build connections um, with their school family, their class communities, or school communities. Um, and this allows for that high level of connection and predictability and students being available to access the learning environment, but also to engage in problem solving. Next slide, please. So why conscious discipline? Um, I think what we want to highlight and we want to emphasize is connections are what wire the brain. Um, those are the th connections are paramount in controlling our impulses and our willingness. Um, without relationships, um, discipline is simply a punishment instead of a motivation. Healthy relationships motivate children and adults to behave and express themselves in ways that are helpful and supportive. Um, in addition to consistency in, in this message, but also language and structures in all elementary buildings in BCPS, um, conscious discipline has a central theme in that it's centered around the concept of school family and community model. Um, so we're modeling healthy families. We're modeling healthy communities. It also affords structure in which the ultimate goal is optimal growth and development of each family or community member. Um, so this is the goal for our students, for our staff in our classrooms. Um, the school and the class families make sure to provide a positive connotation of family. So that coming together, that circling up that you may have seen as evidence, that recognition of what's our celebrations, what are our pockets of excellence that we're growing into as students. We don't all come to the table par perfect, but what are the things we notice and recognize about each other in our growth, but also in our achievements? Um, it also protects family members. It serves as a, a space to problem solve. Um, to talk about challenging topics um, in that circle, in that community. It also affords individuals to work together for the good of the group. And this is really where we talk about productive struggle, being that it's on a topic that's academic or being that it's on a social, emotional level. Um, and it allows for individual differences to shine through and to be honored in that space, but all in the context 
context of creating that environment, that connected environment. So how we did this, um, moving to the next slide. So how have we done this over time? Um, in our BCPS Conscious Discipline Journey. Um, sorry, next slide, please. So um, there's been some changes across offices over time, so I want to preface that here. And um, we began like the 2015-2016 school year where pre-K in early childhood was examining conscious discipline and bringing the practices in. And then it progressed it to um, kindergarten in 2017 as well as to grade one. Um, and then we really started looking at and really ensuring that we had that curriculum element for pre-K through first grade. In the summer of 2019, that's when the shift across an office, uh, across the department came. In early childhood, navigated to school climate. So what we continued to do throughout this time to make sure that it's clear is we were continuing to train our teachers, right? And as we got feedback, be it from the training and the partnership between school climate and early childhood, as we had time to really reflect and look at how things were going, we also started getting feedback that our administrators wanted to, wanted to participate in training too. So um, during this time across our journey, every single year, we have provided training to teachers. And as recommendations have come forward and asks for training have come forward, we've expanded that. So in since the summer of 2019, we really started looking at training, just giving that overview for our elementary school administrators. And we've continued to grow that forward um, each year. And then we expanded in 2019-2020. We went pre-K through third grade. Um, so we're continuing to implement utilizing our resources, purchasing materials, professional learning at a very high level, um, but then also um, the coaching that goes along with that for the just in time in the classroom moments where teachers may have questions or may be wondering, how do I how do I work with my class to get them to circle up? How do I work with my class to set an agreement? That's also been critical to this process. 2019, 2020. Um, there was a committee. We have a system-wide committee that's composed of um, our partners from early childhood, school climate, student support services. We had principals represented, parents who were invited, uh, our parent university partners, um, and we really spent, and teachers, and we spent time really examining our curriculum and themes that came up at that time was really making sure that we were working with our Department of Equity and Cultural Proficiency to make sure that the text that is part of the conscious discipline um, material was culturally responsive. And so we went through and we did that work with the committee and we had curriculum writers that also supported that effort too. The summer of 2020, we continued um, despite um, the, the shift to virtual. We continued in working with our elementary administrators to build their competency and confidence around conscious discipline and how that looked in their school environments. And then in 2020, 2021, uh, we expanded to fourth grade and of course, continuing training uh, for veteran teachers, but also for new teachers and for our fourth grade teachers. Uh, we continue to, to provide those high levels of training, um, coaching and support. Um, in 2021, 2022, we expanded into fifth grade. Again, training to new teachers, veteran teachers to ensure that they had the resources um, to feel confident in the practice, but also the materials. Um, so during this time, while this is great, to talk about the journey, we've also um, been providing um, a wealth of materials to the classroom for impl implementation of text, um, use of text during the lessons to build upon those competencies, um, the social emotional learning competencies we spoke of um, previously. Um, and so the, the integration, if you will, the integration of conscious discipline um, we offer and offer extension activities in our health curriculum as well as in English language arts as as well. But what I will leverage in this is that 
while we use literature based, we do have lessons. The practices are every day. Um, and the, the most recent took place with our adults. Uh, for all of you who attended graduation, there was this question about how do we greet our students? You know, fist bump, high five, shake a hand. What are we going to do as adults, right? And so it made me chuckle every time that came down because that is one of the first practices of conscious discipline. How do you want to be greeted? When students enter, you may have seen as you do school walks, how do children want to be greeted? That's the first level of relationship and engagement that says, I'm here. I care about you. I'm being noticed as being part of this community. How do we welcome each other in space? So I just offer that to all of you to say that while we talk about training and we talk about coaching, there's materials, but there's also, also consideration of that professional learning and that coaching really, in, it, it, it just elevates the adult first practice for our students to extend into that relationship category. And what we know is that when our students are connected, they feel it. They feel that connection to their environment. They know what's coming next and they feel that sense of safety and the resources that they can access in that learning environment. So just giving you kind of a higher level overview, maybe more than you wanted to know, but definitely how we're using our practices in addition to training. So next slide, please. So you heard me highlight this a little bit. Curriculum is part of health and ELA units and it's collaboratively written embedded. So we don't do this without each other. We do this with each other. And then we have a cohort of staff who do the vetting of the content and review the texts um, that are used. And we do have some folks that will try it and come back to us and say, this works, this doesn't work. Um, really to offer to us that feedback um, that that's pivotal um, to ensure that we're using the practices with fidelity. Um, we provide, again, professional learning materials, that coaching, that problem solving. One of the outgrowths this year was when we were talking with schools is really the safe space. Like we know what the safe space is. Are we using it with fidelity? And so spending time really elevating our training, not just for our teachers, not just for our administrators. We also elevated that training with our support staff for our social workers and school counselors, ensuring that they had the tools that could do that higher level problem solving and create, ensure that those spaces were created and coach teachers around that as well. Um, and schools also, the last um, piece of this is that schools model with adults and staff. So we don't just ask that you spend time greeting folks in a classroom or setting agreements or commitments. We also do that in professional learning meetings. We welcome each other into space. We set agreements. This is how we're going to operate in space together. And then we make commitments. I'm going to commit to being fully present today and really walk you through this presentation. You may commit to be just present as best you possibly can be. So these are some of the practices that guide um, guide the work of teachers, but also staff in meetings um, and anything that occurs in our schools. So collaboration amongst the offices, um, many times we're asked, I've highlighted a lot of the work that we have done and continue to do. And what I will offer to you is many of these um, advancements in collaboration are outgrowth of request and information that's been shared with the Conscious Discipline Committee. Um, so spending time with Parent University, there was a request for parents to understand the practices and how can those be um, brought into the home or the community environment. So virtual lunch and learns, um, school-based, we've done a lot of school-based training. Um, we continuing to work with our partners in the Office of Early Childhood Programs. Again, I already highlighted school counseling and social work. Hoff our Office of Health Education, uh, writing and vetting curriculum, um, really aligning um, to the SEL, the SEL um, framework, but also those health standards um, to ensure that we're in alignment with growing the whole child. And so um, also with the Office of Teacher Development, um, spending time in NEO, um, developing um, high level overviews at NEO, and that that right after that is when we actually have um, new teacher training for conscious discipline as well. Next slide, please. I was gonna say, so in, in, 
I just want to say, sure. just be mindful of our time because I have another item after your Seth. Sorry. <laughs> but no thank problem. you for sharing all the details. Absolutely. Um, when you look at the cost and pricing structure, this is the structure, the pricing structure for our materials um, that we have used over the years. Um, this structure in materials um, well, we're not going to be spending as much on materials, and the reason being is because we have rolled this out in pre-K to five. At any time, it will be to supplement and add any additional texts or inform, um, materials that may need to be replaced, so we have done that. We also seek the contract for professional learning, coaching, and consultation. So one of the things that was recognized I know previously was our kindergarten readiness um, assessment data. And so one of the things that we continue to look at is social foundations. Um, and there are multiple items, um, including selective response and performance tasks to measure the skills and behaviors, um, really to determine what students entering K know and can do across four domains. Um, for the purpose of this, we'll focus on social foundations, and this is really looking at how students express themselves, understand and respond to their feelings, follow routines and multi step directions, share materials, all of those key features of social emotional learning competencies, um, as well as delay gratification. Um, and what you're going to see is that students are continuing to grow in this area and demonstrate. Um, demonstrate their readiness. Next slide, please. We also looked at our stakeholder survey and we looked at the 2017 in contrast to 2020, 2021. And so a sense of belonging increased when we looked at um, how students felt safer in their school buildings after conscious discipline was implemented school wide. And, and I fully acknowledge there are many um, factors in this data. However, conscious discipline does appear to be having a positive influence on the feelings of safe and secure students um, with respect to the data that's, that's um, in front of you. Next slide, please. Um, there, there are a vast array of comments and share that we've had from teachers and administrators, but we did pull two that we thought were really um, powerful reflections from our elementary school staff. Um, and it really speaks to putting the philosophy into practice and what it's done for teachers in their practice um, and what's happening and how they can rec their recognition in the, the change process of the learning environment. And with that, I will conclude and welcome any questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Mustafer. Mr. Thomas, I know you have a question. Put it in the chat. Go right ahead. Yes, it's a comment. Um, I just want to state that I visited many elementary schools this year, and at least 70% of the time when I asked principal, what is the difference between your first year at this school until now? They've all talked about conscious discipline and the role that it's played in their community. I remember at 7th District, I, elementary school, their principal was taking me into each classroom, showing me the conscious system of things and talking about how, and I asked them how would we improve every school and they were like continuing to invest in it, continuing to lean into conscious discipline and that work, it really changes the school environment here and it made it so much better. And I, I wish I could like remember exactly what she said because I was really blown away. And from that visit, I kept asking in other schools about conscious discipline and at Halstead Academy, they said the exact same thing, especially for their full day pre-K program that they have at Halstead Academy. So I am really excited about this and, and seeing another contract being brought forward about this. I really hope that we can continue to expand it and, and, and make it more robust across our system. And I'll be supporting this. Thank you. Oh, Ms. Causey. Good afternoon, thank you. Um, thank you for that presentation. And I did have a, um, a couple questions. The first one is, so the school system's already been using this for um, several years. So is it going to be an extension of a current contract or an increase in spending authority that um, will be coming to the board? So um, the contract is is continuing. Um, and we will continue to expand um, as well, but it's not an increase in cost. 
actually it's a um, decrease in the amount of contract from the previous one. Um, and as shared previously, the change is really because we have been diligent about providing materials, but we also know that materials need to be replaced. Uh, we've been diligent about building um, an infrastructure to provide support and coaching to our teachers and our staff across the school system, as well as the professional learning. But we all know that we need to continue to grow. And to do that, we still need to be able to consult the experts um, and make sure that we're continuing to grow the capacity um, of our staff, our leaders in training, um, but also as tools continue to um, be developed, we need to be able to access that information and consider whether or not that is something um, that we want to continue with in Baltimore County. So um, we're not increasing the spending, we're actually decreasing the spending as a result of infrastructure growth. Well, that is uh, <laughs> that is new <laughs> and exciting. Um, the next question I had is, and I appreciate Mr. Thomas's um, comments about visiting schools, and I wondered if there had been any structured surveys to teachers and um, in-school administrators um, specifically about this program and the impact, and if there were any um, you know, suggestions for improvement in terms of whether it's training. Um, so I wonder if there was any specific survey uh, that was done. Yeah, so in preparation for um, just considering how, how we are doing and getting feedback from schools, we did. And um, things that rose to the surface was continuing with the training um, and then also the coaching. There's an ask for coaching, but intentional time for implementation as well. So those are two big pieces of really working to understand how conscious discipline as a social emotional learning practice can be integrated and we continue to work on that um, with our school level administrators. But yes, we did ask and, and those were the those were the primary um, suggestions that were provided. OK, and um, the slide that speaks to kindergarten readiness assessment. Um, mm -hmm. You have its KRA 2021 performance levels. Um, did you compare that? Is there a slide that's available? for a year prior to um, the system-wide rollout? Prior to the initial rollout? Yes, or yes. So okay. I, if, I, if I may, uh, Trish, um, one thing, Ms. Causey, is there has been some differences in our KRA administration over the last couple of years. We had moved from a comprehensive um, administration a number of years ago where we were doing samplings and this year I believe we are back to a full comprehensive um, survey. So just to let you know Ms. Causet that there was some difference in that methodology um, but go ahead Trish I just wanted to make sure I clarified that. <laughs> No, that's a great point, and that's actually, thank you, Dr. McComas, that's actually where I was going with it because that was what was shared with me, is there's been differences in measurement, but I definitely wanted to make sure to highlight that we are seeing growth in this area as we continue to advance and enhance the practice. Okay, so what I can do, Ms. Causey, is I'll do a follow-up and I will send you that comparison data because I understand you want to see the impact, so. Yes, I mean, that's wonderful news. Sure. Um, so this year, K, the KRA 2021 performance levels that are in front of us, was that methodology the sampling or the comprehensive student population? This year's was the comprehensive, and I'll ask Kevin Conley um, to correct me if I'm wrong, or Ms. Shea, I know you, or Ms. Uh, Dr. Wiste, I know you, your early childhood too. Hi, Mary. No, what you said was absolutely true. Uh, we moved from a sampling um, to one year where we did full day pre-K plus the sampling to uh, students who had participated in full day pre-K plus the sampling. And now um, moving forward from this year on, we're doing uh, you know, full census testing. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. That's all for now. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Mr. Offerman. I don't have any questions, thank you. OK, um, do I have a motion? Let me point out, I just saw an email that came in with a lot of questions um, that I haven't had time to even look at, and I realized, Dr. McComas, you're not even on there. 
So I'm going to hold my questions, forward the email to you, and ask that the questions be be answered or be provided so th those answers would be available when this contract comes to building and contracts, just so that we don't have to tie up everybody here. Sure, I appreciate that. Our team has um, sent that on and they have been working to okay. complete those responses. Um, so we will definitely be able to do that. Okay, thank you. Um, do I have a motion to approve? Wait, I got to get back to my other window. Um, <laughs> To approve um, the Loving Guidance Conscious Discipline contract? So move, Thomas. Do I have a second? Second, Offerman. May I have a roll call vote, please, Ms. Cox? Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Causey? Uh, yes. Mr. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Thank you. Um, the motion passes. And then our last contract is vocabulary.com. Ms. Shea? Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm joined here today by Ms. Beth Reed. Um, Ms. Reed is a specialist. We can only see you from your nose up, Ms. Reed. Okay. Sorry. Thank <laughs> you look you. like the neighbor on Home Improvement. Um, <laughs> so, Ms. Reed is here today. Um, she is a specialist in our Office of Secondary ELA um, to talk to us about vocabulary.com. It is a new contract, but it is replacing. We actually have had a contract for vocabulary.com in the past. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Reed. She'll talk to you a little bit about, for those of you new to the committee, um, some of you may remember this. She'll talk a little bit about what the resource is, how we use it, a little usage data, um, just as a quick update. I know we have about eight minutes, Ms. Reed, so we're going to use our fast talking. Okay, can do. Um, this contract is going to provide for the continued use of vocabulary.com, which is an online platform for interactive vocabulary development and learning. Academic context uh, content specific to the site was discussed at the Gen, uh, June 6th Curriculum Committee meeting. Um, this initiative aligns to the compass through focus area one, learning, accountability, and results, and addresses key initiative four, um, disciplinary literacy. And move to the next slide. Vocabulary.com supports word learning through research-based practices, including multiple exposures. It supports disciplinary literacy initiatives because teachers from all content areas can create lists using text sources, their own core resources, or by using a searchable database on the site. Word lists can then be shared with students, or students could even generate their own word lists to study or to play adaptive games and to achieve word mastery. Teachers can then monitor student progress and performance through that personalized dashboard available on the site. Have the next slide, please. Vocabulary.com is um, increasing in price just a little bit from $4 to $5 per student per year. Um, and professional learning is going to be provided for teachers new to this platform. So we're asking for an extension of this contract, but um, it is not an increase in cost um, overall, simply because we're reducing the, the term of the contract. Are there any more slides? That is it, and I do have some usage data I can share. Like it was, it was quick. Um, so to date, I can share that um, students in Baltimore County have answered over 11 million questions this year on vocabulary on vocabulary.com. Um, what that translates to is that about seven million of those questions were answered correct correctly, and using their algorithm, students have mastered almost 500,000 words. Thank you. That's helpful. <laughs> Because I love words. If, um, if I can <laughs> add just um, quickly to um, <laughs> we know that this committee often asks around price per student, but what I wanted to um, share that Ms. Reed mentioned, what we purchase actually is an enterprise license for every student in schools, which means that all of the teachers of every content can use it. Um, and that's really important in our efforts in secondary classes in particular to improve disciplinary literacy across content. In fact, in one of the schools, 
um, one of the teachers that used it the most was a PE teacher who used it a lot to support instruction in physical education. So um, in our high school, sometimes some of our teachers use it um, within their content, but also for things like SAT prep. Um, we have many of our um, social studies teachers use it as well as, of course, our ELA teachers often use it to supplement our novels. So one of the things that we like so much about this program um, is that our uh, teachers across the disciplines within the whole school can use a similar approach. So I see in the chat that Mr. Thomas has some experience with this, so um, I will turn it back to all of you. Thank you very much for this information. Um, I do have some questions about this and vocabulary.com was approved on July 9, 2019 with a contract end date of 4-30-2020. No, I'm sorry, initial end date. Um, and then it was brought back for a modification. The initial contract was 330 and the modification amount the following year, actually it was less than a year, was for 516,000, bringing it up to a total cost of 846. Um, and I can submit these in writing because I'm trying to understand the math because in the body of that contract, it says the average annual spending on the original contract was 158.625. And if I take three years of that, it comes to less than 500,000. So I, my big overarching question is, why would we ask for a contract spending authority? And I know this isn't that. And I, again, I'm gonna submit it in writing, but I did wanna point out that I have, I'm very happy to see the 11 million because I have been, um, casually polling teachers um, about their use of vocabulary.com. And just last night, two teachers who were celebrating almost the end of school mentioned to me, one did not even know it existed and one did know it existed, but she uses, um, hold on, Spell City, which is free. And, um, Again, I'll submit some questions before building in contracts, but I want to know what this, what we would get from vocabulary.com for a spending authority of 846,000 that we could not get for Spell City um, for free. And so I don't know that you have to answer it, but I'm going to just, um, you know, send some questions. Um, Mr. Offerman, do you have any questions? Uh, I would like to see what uh, is, is there a way to check what uh, what excuse me, is there a way to check what percent of uh, teachers and, and students are using this? Yeah, so we do have some student numbers that we can share as well. We also have the number of teachers per school. We can share that data as well that we can send in, in a follow on. Um, and, and I can just briefly share, you know, there, there are a ton of free resources and you can Google and find resources that can do just about anything. Some of the highlights of what I will say just in general about free resources versus those that are rostered is of course our data privacy and ensuring that our students are doing it in a safe environment. Um, it's also about being able to track student progress. If you use a free site, you either have to not give any information to try to protect privacy, which then also means you can't track growth or progress. Um, and so that's the number one reason that I certainly would always prefer one that we have vetted that we know is aligned to standards and has rigorous content um, and that also ensures our students data privacy is honored. We roster this program, which means that all of the information has gone through our safe um, environment according to our data privacy and sharing agreements that also allows us to make those content connections. So as um, Miss Reed shared, we can actually change content lists. Some of those free programs, when you generate lists, this allows teachers to make a customized list that align to our curriculum standards across the content areas. It also allows students to use platforms across multiple um, courses, which I mentioned before. So when you have free programs, you could have a student that has one teacher likes this program, another teacher likes that program. 
Your second point, as you know, we always talk about with implementation. We have a, a large teacher turnover. We have a large number of teachers. We are consistently uh, sending communication through department chairs, through Schoology and through administrators to uh, make sure teachers are aware of these different program options. Um, and that's just always an ongoing challenge that as we continue to bring on new staff and as we continue to provide professional learning, we've modeled. We've had students enter into um, vocabulary bowls where they're competing with other students. Um, we've seen, uh, I would say, probably more use case in middle schools. I'm not sure which teachers you were polling, but um, we definitely see an increase in middle school versus high schools. Um, and it's just an ongoing um, effort. So um, I can certainly share the number of teachers per school um, because we do have that data and I do have the number of active um, students um, as well. But those are just some of my basic responses and I'd certainly be happy to follow up once you send them. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I actually did want to answer your question. Ironically, the teacher who knew about vocabulary.com only had six years and a 20 year teacher didn't. So I don't know what that says. I, I, I just thought it was ironic. Sure. Um, that that in this case, um, that was how it turned out. So I'll submit them. I'm sorry, Mr. Offerman. I think you had a question or a follow up. No, I know I'm fine. OK, and um, so I'll I'll submit those questions and I appreciate the responses yeah. and Miss Causey. Thank you, um, and I just wanted to um, thank you for this presentation. Uh, we know vocabulary is very important and we also want to be effective and, and efficient um, as we provide these resources to um, teachers, staff, and students. So my question kind of dovetailed with um, the content areas and how often and it, the mechanism for using it for SAT. Um, and you know, can it be made, uh, is it made available directly to students without uh, teacher support? You yes. know, if a, Yes, yeah, so um, yes and. So a couple things I can share. Um, students um, do not have to wait to be assigned. The program has some pre-generated lists for things like SAT, ACT, and different tests. Also has lists sometimes um, by content. Uh, some of the lists that are very popular are Greek and Latin uh, roots, which again is also helpful for the SAT, um, but is also um, sometimes uh, part of a language development program. So students have direct access that they can use themselves um, for some of the site generated lists. They don't have to wait for a teacher to assign it. But then of course we do have teachers have the ability to assign excerpts. So one of the things that's really great is teachers across any content can actually cut and paste into the program an excerpt of a text, a complex text that they're reading, whether it's in social studies or a technical text in CTE, or as I mentioned, the PE teacher uh, was one example. And the system will then generate lists based on those research, that evidence-based research around tier vocabulary and what's a tier two word versus tier three. Um, the other thing that's great that some of those free sites do not do, a lot of the evidence-based research on vocabulary development is about distributed practice. Students need to have multiple and encounters with a word in multiple contexts um, to be able to truly what we call master or know that word. So um, some of those free lists might uh, generate a quiz. I know my daughter used to like Quizlet and things like of that nature as well. Um, but what this program does is based on that science around vocabulary word learning, which is about that distributed practice and seeing it in multiple contexts. So students will encounter the word, have to identify the definition, have to read it in context, have to read multiple meanings of the word, find a synonym, find an antonym, multiple different interactions with that word so that they truly can be deemed as mastering that word. So um, I think I answered your questions, Ms. Causey, but there were a couple in one. Yes, and then the other thing is just uh, to review and make sure that uh, see if there's any other software program that that also has vocabulary capabilities um, because sometimes when we've seen um, contract modifications or coming forward there's or new ones, it seems like we already have similar ones. So again, if we've got a wonderful product, we don't want to have multiple out there. Um, the other question was, um, about the student data privacy. So the uh, student data privacy agreement has changed over time. It's strengthened over time. Um, and so there, um, my understanding is that when there are uh, changes to the contracts, uh, that is the time to ask our vendors to um, 
yep. re up with with what's new. Is Correct. that the yep. case? And, mm -hmm. and um, Miss Reed might be able to speak a little bit, so I don't want to cut her off if she wants to, because she worked directly with um, procurement. But I believe that was also part of why we didn't just do an extension, but we rather did a new contract was so that that would be a part of that process. If we could have that um, re-signed. So Miss Reed, is there anything that you want to add? Um, we just met this week as part of a digital review with the um, our tech team and the vendor, and it has passed everything on that um, student data privacy regulation. OK, that's fantastic because we know with all of the increased um, use of digital resources, there's increase of um, uh, yeah. cyber crimes and mm -hmm. things like that. So right. thank you. Again, another reason we don't love the free ones. Yeah. Yeah. It does. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah, I was just going to say the the free programs do unintentionally uh, make us vulnerable, right? I mean, we've all been through the worst in terms of the cyber attack last year, but um, that's all part of their stringent vetting process. So, thank, thank you. you, Mr. Thomas. Maybe your Mr. Thomas, this could be your last question or comment. Oh my gosh! It, it oh, is. I'm honored. <laughs> wow. No pressure. <laughs> well, I just wanted to say that back in eighth grade, I used this in my I think my uh, GT science class almost every single day whenever we were in new, a new unit. I remember the ecological unit. I was stuck on like three words that sounded the same, and I remember being so frustrated, but I loved using this. There's actually also an app for vocabulary.com yep. that I completely forgot about because I had it back <laughs> in school. I wish I had kept using it instead of paying for Quizlet Plus on my own, so I could, I could have a no ad service. And I, I completely forgot that this existed in high school. So I think there's some things that we can do to continue to spread the word about this, but yeah. I support this full heartedly. Um, and I am super glad that uh, this is coming forward. My question is, what are some of the ways that you've been trying to I know you mentioned professional development, but can you expand on those ways to try to expand this for greater usage? Sure. In addition to new educator orientation and professional study day, we also provide ongoing um, training throughout the year, especially if um, there are schools that have included this as part of their initiatives and strategies for school progress planning. Um, we definitely meet the school needs when there's an ask there. We also sponsor um, inter-school jams and, and hold jams, you know, across the county and even within um, a network of schools within a certain area that has happened. And we provide, um, you know, certificates as Jam Master certificates uh, for these competitions. And we have some bracelets. If you're, you know, participate a lot, you get a Jam Master bracelet. So and, we, um, we have initiatives. <laughs> I, I do think, too, Mr. Thomas, to your point, and and um, Ms. Max earlier, um, I do think going directly to students, maybe even working with ROA and letting students who are getting ready to take the SAT know or getting ready um, would be another avenue that I don't know that we've explored as much. Um, and then certainly working with Parent University, we work closely with Suhan on another, a number of other initiatives. And so I think it would also help some of our um, parents help support their students um, to, to be able to learn that vocabulary alongside them. So I certainly also took notes about other ways we can um, spread the word. And then I will also share, while Ms. Reed um, leads this initiative, because of our work through a reading apprenticeship and really focusing on disciplinary literacy, our other content areas do something similar, which is why I think we're seeing an increase with some of our social studies and content teachers using this resource as well. Yeah, and I could add that I'm on the um, SAT committee, you know, our, our work groups, and I've mentioned it to Heather Woldridge, and we're going to be working together with that office too. Um, as part of their curriculum revisions, they'll be putting vocabulary.com into their curriculum pieces. Awesome, that's incredible. And as someone who took Latin and had to memorize Latin roots in my magnet uh, class, again, I, I really wish I had been using this instead of paying for a separate service. So thank you so Kristen, much. And I had paper flashcards because I'm 100 years old. We didn't even have an app, so. I still have index cards in a box, so. Um, I hesitated to say the word flashcard to indicate <laughs> my age. We got you, Miss Cause. You Here I am. You know, we, we like vintage methods. It's OK. Mm -hmm. It's all good. Mm -hmm. Old school. Mm -hmm. So do I have a motion to approve? I'm telling you, I'm not, I'm not doing well toggling a contract vocab for vocabulary.com. So, so move, move Miss Causey, or second Miss Causey. Miss Cox, could you do a roll call vote? Sure. Mac, Miss Mac? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Mr. Thomas? For the last time. Yes. For the last time. <laughs> <laughs> the motion passes. Um, as far as announcements, um, obviously, 
The first announcement is this is Mr. Thomas's last curriculum committee meeting. And we will miss him and the next announcement, I guess it's going to be about two months before we work with our new student member because Dr. Uh, McComas, correct me, correct me if I'm wrong, we do not have a meeting in July. That's correct. We do uh, take a recess from the committee work in the month of July. And um, so you're right. Our next one would be, I believe it's August 18th. I almost want to say we have to go back and look at that very first slide where we had the schedule. Uh, but it's yes, go ahead, Ms. Shea. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I just I had put something in the chat in reference yeah. to a question Ms. Causey had about a and I want to make sure it's on the record that I did double check with the team. We have not purchased any ascend licenses to date because schools have shifted to the math assistance model that we described. Um, we did allow for schools if when planning for students next year, they still see that need arise because we do still have that contract spending authority. But as to date, we have not purchased any licenses for that ascend math program. So I just wanted to close that loop for the record. Thank you for providing that input very much. Sure. So, Mr. Thomas, we want to hear from you. Um, go ahead. And not that not that you've ever had a problem talking oh. to us. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. Uh, before I say something, I was going to thank you now. For the board members that contributed to a gift um, for me, a last board meeting, I just want, while we're in the curriculum committee meeting, I'd you like brought to a Ferrari. Is that what you're going to say? No, I bought 12 books while we're in the curriculum committee meeting, many of which were in BCBS curriculum that I didn't get to read because I was in other classes. So I have I had a plan this summer to read um, at least to read as many classics as I could um, classical American literature. So I, I purchased a bunch of those books and I'm excited to read them to everyone on the curriculum committee. Um, thank you so much for an amazing year. I've loved working with this committee. This is my favorite committee out of all of the committees. And um, it's been an honor to serve as student member of the board this year, and I'm wishing you all the best. And I want to, again, thank you all so much. Thank Mr. you. Thomas, if, uh, thank the count you. of Monte Cristo is not on that list, please add it. <laughs> okay, I'll add it now. That's you a fantastic hilarious. book. Hilarious book. <laughs> well, thank you, everyone. If there's no further business, um, the meeting is adjourned, and I hope all of you have a wonderful summer. Even those of you who have to work full time through, during the summer, I hope it's better. Thank you very much. It will be. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone, thank you. for a great committee a meeting and a great year in the committee. Take care. Good luck, Christian. Have a great summer and a wonderful start to your next uh, career in college. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Bye bye. Bye.